Okay, well, I think we're uh, good to go live now. I'd like to welcome everybody to this latest uh, Royal Astronomical Society uh, public lecture. I'm Robert Massey, I'm Deputy Director of the Society, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. This is part of our long running program. Uh, it's a, an absolute pleasure to have Professor Heino Falke here today, who's going to be telling us about uh, fantastic science around black holes. Uh, just falls to me to give you a few words on, on who he is and what he's done. Uh, Professor Falker received his PhD summa cum laude in 1994 from the University of Bonn. He was a postdoc at the University of Maryland, visiting professor at the University of Arizona, staff scientist at the Max Planck, the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn and the Netherlands National Radio Astronomy Institute, Astrong, in Dwingaloo. And since 2007, he's been a full professor of astroparticle physics and radio astronomy at the Radboud University of Nijmegen, in the, again in the Netherlands. He was, crucially for the talk today, one of the founders of the Event Horizon Telescope and chair of its Science Council until 2019. He's a member of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, a recipient of the Spinoza Prize, the highest science award in the Netherlands, and he has two European Research Council grants. And recently, he wrote the best-selling book, Light in the Darkness, Black Holes, The Universe and Us, about the first image of a black hole. And I'm just going to tab back to the the webinar itself. Um, so I will uh, switch myself off and hand you over to Professor Falker. I would remind people, by the way, as with all these uh, talks, if you have questions and we're expecting a lot of people to be in attendance, a lot of people to be asking questions, please use the Q&A box and we'll happily take those at the end. We expect to be hearing from Professor Falker for about the next uh, three quarters of an hour or so. So there should be plenty of opportunity to ask questions. If you're on YouTube, my colleague Lucinda who's working in the background will manage that and we'll paste those into the chat that we can see. So everybody should have a chance to put questions. If there are a lot of questions, we of course don't guarantee to be able to answer all of them, but we'll do our best. So with that, I don't think I need to say much more other than to hand over to Professor Falker. So Heino, over to you. Thank you, Robert, for this very nice introduction. Uh, I'm glad to be with you today here. Um, well, here in my home in, in the vicinity of Cologne in, in Germany, um, talking to you in England. And I hope I can be in, come in present at some point uh, again. And uh, I think this is now starting again. And uh, I, I want to take you to the edge of space and time to look into the darkest darkness in the universe that are created by black holes. Uh, we will be looking at the shadow of a black hole and I explain a little bit uh, what that is, how we made that image, um, what, you know, and what still is to be expected in terms of imaging black holes. Now, if you look at, you know, why are black holes so important? Where do they come from? And it's because they are the most extreme form of gravity that we can encounter in this universe. And what gravity is has been a, you know, an interesting discovery over the last century. It was Isaac Newton who came up with the idea based on the theories of, of Kepler and, uh, and Copernicus to explain the planetary uh, system, uh, that there is a force called gravity that pulls things together. And so, you know, the reason why we stand on Earth is because there is pulls on us and uh, that's why apples fall to the ground all the time. Albert Einstein challenged that view a little bit by actually radically challenged that view by saying that gravity, we shouldn't see gravity as a force, but we should see it as a property of space and time itself. That, that actually gravity is just the consequence of mass and energy curving space in time. As curving space time. And so if you have a mass like the Earth or anything else, uh, it will actually produce a little dent in the fabric of space time. And so if you then, you know, we, we picture space as a two dimensional surface in this case, if you then roll a ball, so to speak, it has to follow the curvature of space and will go, go around uh, that, that mass, like the planets do. So that way you can explain uh, the motion of planets. And in fact, also this little dot that's rotating around here, if it's a planet, will make a little dent. And you'll have a little dance between the dents of this planet and the sun, and that will influence the motion. And that, he was able to show, explained very well the orbit of Mercury at the time. Uh, Mercury was not quite following, following Newton's law. And by, you know, coming up with his new theory, he was able 
to explain that tiny discrepancy that astronomers had measured in the 19th century that most people probably wouldn't care about. But it was crucial. And it was crucial to you know, everything we do today in terms of navigation. Because you know, when you use a, G a GPS navigation system these days, you have to make use of the theory of general relativity. And that has to do with the fact that you know, a consequence of this change of uh, view, how we view space, changed also view how we see time. Because neither space nor time is something you can touch. Space and time is only what you can measure. And how do you measure it? You measure it with light actually. Light is, turned out, is the only constant, so to speak, in this universe. And that was already in the theory of electromagnetic radiation that described light and, and, and radio waves and every, every electromagnetic radiation that we see by James Clerk Maxwell in the 19th century. And that was a strange, a strange aspect of that theory because, you know, in the theory it said that the speed of light would be constant wherever you are. Wherever you look at a light ray, how fast you move, light would always move with the same constant speed, c, as we call it, a constant number. And um, that had profound impacts in the evolution of how relativity came about. Now, if you have a dent in space-time, uh, the shortest way is no longer a straight line, the shortest way is actually a curved line. And so also light would be bent. But light is a wave. Light actually has a, uh, a measure of time built in, that's a frequency. How, long, how fast it oscillates gives you, like the ticks in a clock, gives you a, a way to count time or to measure time. Now, what happens if suddenly space is curved? Space has to go essentially a longer path length. You know, the, 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 the space is stretched and then also light becomes stretched. It has to make longer steps. But in order to keep the velocity the same, because the speed of light always has to be constant. If, you know, the velocity is speed divided by time, uh, kilometers per second or miles per whatever unit you use in the UK to measure time, you probably, it's, it's probably the same unit as, as in Europe, isn't it? But, um, okay, miles per, per hour. Um, if you, you know, if you change the length and you want to keep the space, uh, the velocity constant, you also have to change the time. Yeah, so length, length becomes longer, then time also has to become longer in order to keep the ratio, which is velocity, the same. And so that's what you see, you know, just schematically shown here. Light becomes stretched as it goes through a, a stretched space-time. It makes longer steps and it appears as if time is going slower uh, near a mass. And that sounds strange, but it's exactly what we measure these days. If you use the GPS system, as I mentioned, then we compare the arrival times of radio signals radio light signals from satellites up in space. And it turns out that clocks up there go faster than here on Earth, simply because of less curvature up there. And so we actually have to send atomic clocks up there which are detuned, which you know don't go at the right speed here on Earth, but they go at the right speed once they're launched, because time uh, it changes. Now, if you go to an extreme case, and that was calculated by Carl Schwarzschild in, the, in 1916, just a few months after Albert Einstein uh, came up with the theory of relativity. He was looking at the most simple system you can think of uh, that describes gravity. And that's not an apple, that's not an earth, that's not a planetary system. It's just a point, a point mass, where all the mass is concentrated in one point. And all physicists know that this is just a theory, this is just something that doesn't appear in, in reality. It's just a mathematical approximation to, approximation to make life easy. So we thought at least. And so thought Al Albert Einstein as well. But you know, when you did this with this, uh, with this simple assumption, uh, some weird things happened. Now, if you go closer and closer to such a mass, curvature becomes steeper and steeper. And as you see, uh, Planets and particles have to rotate faster and faster uh, in order to not fall in the gravitational potential of, uh, of this object. And if you take this to the extreme, you get close to an object which is just a point source. Um, what you then come across is a region where a, 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 
a planet or whatever would have to rotate with the speed of light or even faster to not fall into this funnel. And that actually is prohibited because nothing can go faster than speed of light. That's another, you know, uh, fundamental aspect of the nature of light. If, as soon as you have mass, you cannot go faster than the speed of light. So something got to happen. And it turns out if you calculate, you know, what the properties of, of light is, are in this, uh, in this uh, circumstances, then light that will go into this gravitational potential and will actually cross that boundary, then light will not be able to escape ever. In fact, you know, it would have, light would have to go faster than speed of light to escape, you know, and light can't do this. And we call this region the event horizon. That's a point of no return, where everything that passes that point will never come back. In fact, if you think about this as if in three-dimensional space, this is not a point or a, sur uh, or a, you know, a flat surface, it's actually the, the surface of a virtual sphere that surrounds a point mass in the very, very center. So that's how you need to picture an, an event horizon. And uh, if you then look at, at what time seems to do or what, what time does, if you look at it, if you look at it from a distance, you would see actually light waves being stretched to almost to infinity, in fact, at the edge of, of, a, of what we now call a black hole. Um, and so time would actually be stretched to infinity. It would actually come to a halt. It would stand still. From, at least as seen from the outside. Which is very different from, by the way, just to make this clear, if you fall into a black hole, then your time will be just very normal. Your time will be as always, you won't see any difference. And if you just hover above the event horizon briefly before you disappear and you're able, you just, you know, you have a rocket which is very, very, very powerful. You can hover, the, hover there and not fall inside. And you can look back at the universe. What you would see is you would actually see the rest of the universe speed up uh, like crazy. And so, you know, you would have a different time when, you, when you're able to escape before you go in. You would come back. Your time, your age would still be much younger than your twin, for example, that remained on Earth. So these are very weird uh, circumstances. And, you know, it's even weirder to think what's happening behind the event horizon because, you know, nothing can escape, no information can come out. We don't know what's happening inside. We could calculate it, but we can't tell. And, you know, people like Albert Einstein and many physicists thought that's just, you know, theory. That doesn't exist. It's a, it's a unicorn, so to speak, a pink unicorn that, that you know, is, is nice to think about, but in reality doesn't exist. In fact, Albert Einstein wrote a paper in 1932, I think, uh, showing that, you know, these objects can't explain, can't form, you know, in nature, they wouldn't be, wouldn't be made. Well, turns out he was wrong and he was very quickly shown to be wrong by first by Oppenheimer, uh, and later by Penrose that in fact, black holes uh, can form and actually a natural consequence of his own theory. And the way they form is actually relatively you know, straightforward, when you go to the end of the lifetime of, of, of a star, a star will explode when it's very, very heavy, when it has a lot of energy, when it has a lot of mass, like 20, 30 times the mass of, of the sun, it will actually implode because, you know, it runs out of fuel and then the inner parts will be compressed and then you have an explosion or implosion uh, uh, cloud going out, as you see here, there's actually the, the, the remnant of a supernova explosion. And you can see these things, you know, still expanding with 5,000 kilometers per second. Um, but the inner region here in the, in the very center will be compressed uh, to, you know, very, very small regions. So you have, you know, 10 times uh, the mass of the sun uh, compressed into like tens of 30 kilometers. And then you have so much mass in such a small region that the curvature of space-time is enormous, the, the, the force of gravity is enormous because there's so much mass there, it will actually further pull this thing together and it will be a collapse that never stops because we don't know of any force that can stop that collapse, that can work into, to, uh, against gravity when you have so much mass compressed. So, black holes can form, we, we understand this now, stars form, stars, stars explode, and black holes come out as a natural end product of star formation. And then there are even monster black holes. If you go to a star system, Milky Way, a, a galaxy where you have hundreds of billions of stars uh, orbiting around the very center of a galaxy, 
then in the very center of a galaxy, this is the Andromeda galaxy, which pretty much looks like our own galaxy, um, you have millions of stars in a region where we here in our you know, cosmic neighborhood have just one, right? Where we have one sun and the next uh, star is like uh, uh, four light years away. Uh, in this region, we'd have millions of stars. You know, the, the star would be littered with uh, lighting up uh, with stars if we, we would live in the center of a galaxy. And there you would have many small black holes and uh, maybe some bigger ones and the bigger ones will swallow up the smaller ones and they will swallow up gas and they will start growing like crazy over the evolution of the universe. And so in the very center of galaxies, we find strong evidence that uh, supermassive black holes exist, which have sizes of millions to a billion uh, solar masses. And in fact, it looks like what we see is that if you look at a galaxy, the bigger the, ga the galaxy is, in fact, how bigger the central part of a galaxy is, the bigger is the black hole mass. And then if you want to, if you ask yourself, you know, can I actually ever see black holes? Something I was, you know, you know, wondering about because I, I'm someone who wants to, you know, I, I want to see things. Um, where would you have to look? Well, you have to look at the galaxies which are really big, which are nearby. So, and there are two good, good choices. One is, of course, our own galaxy, the Milky Way. That's obviously the closest big galaxy in our neighborhood. And it, there's evidence for the massive black hole in the center. But there's another galaxy up here uh, called M87, which is a big elliptical galaxy. It sits in a cluster of, uh, of, of many galaxies of, uh, in our you know, cosmic neighborhood, 55 million light years away. It's not that far, actually, from an astronomical point of view. Uh, and it's a big central galaxy which has undergone lots of mergers, galaxies been falling in and, you know, this was, it's just a, the, the big fat guy in, in the very center and that also has the biggest uh, black hole in the very center uh, in, in our cosmic neighborhood. So these two galaxies are the ones we want to look at. And in fact, measuring the mass of the black hole or the dark object in the, the center of the Milky Way was uh, the, uh, the reason for the Nobel Prize that was given last year to um, Gaze and Gensel and, you know, also uh, Penrose, who was, did mathematical and theoretical um, uh, work uh, that preceded that. Now, if I give a brief introduction to the two galaxies. This here is an image of M87, which was, by, by the way, first discovered as a weird source in 1918. That was a time when we didn't even know that galaxies are galaxies. People thought these were just nebula, maybe part of our own Milky Way. Uh, that they are so far away is something that came, you know, known only sp uh, later. And what you see here is that there's also a little streak of light in this very center. Um, and then if you take a radio telescope, you see a completely different story. This little streak of light becomes the dominating feature. You see something shooting out out of, out of this very center of the galaxy. We call this a plasma, a radio jet. Um, and in fact, that radio jet is able to, you know, inflate an entire bubble of, uh, of gas that, uh, that surrounds the entire galaxy. Um, and that picture was taken with the LOFAR telescope. Uh, that's, you know, in a low frequency telescope in, in, in Europe. And in the very center, there's in fact some evidence that there is a dark, uh, dark mass as well. And that mass is about a, a few billion solar masses. The same in our Milky Way. If you now look in our Milky Way, this is here uh, the plane of our Milky Way seen from the side. And you see these dark patches here. These are dust clouds. In fact, these dust clouds are the cradle of life and of new stars. That's how new stars are being formed. And that's happening in the disk of a galaxy. And, uh, and they're great and they're nice and we wouldn't be here without them. But unfortunately, they block our view of the central region, of the center of the galaxy. And so it took near infrared light and radio light to actually be able to penetrate through this dust. And we are zooming now in to the center of our Milky Way and switching over to infra near infrared light. And we suddenly see the central region light up with stars uh, in the central regions. And now we see this video that actually, you know, created, you know, gave the Nobel Prize. And it shows, you know, stars measured over 16 years. And what you see here is that these stars move. And, uh, and, and this, this one here actually, uh, even uh, makes a almost full elliptical circle around the central region. So, um, so it moves essentially like a planet around the sun on an elliptical uh, curve. 
And you, know, you can use then the laws of, of Kepler, of Newton, uh, you know, that you can use that, that or describe the motion of planet around the sun. You could use that, turn it around uh, and apply it to the star and ask how much mass has to be in the very center that this star is not flung out into space. You know, it moves with 5,000 kilometers per second, okay? So it's a very fast motion. And if it goes around, uh, you need a lot of mass here in order to, to keep it tight, to, to avoid it being shot out. Um, and what you find is you need 4 million times the mass of the sun concentrated into this tiny little point here in the very center of our galaxy. And if you look there, uh, what, what is in this very central region? Um, and you can, you know, you can look in the radio and then the radio actually, radio penetrates through the dust and what you see is that the entire disk of our galaxy lights up. Uh, it's a bright region here, that's the disk of our galaxy and the central region here uh, called Sagittarius A, uh, the brightest radio source in the constellation Sagittarius. Uh, if you further zoom in, you see this nice structure here of a, what we call the mini spiral and in the very center there's a little little point here uh, a lot of radio emission coming out of a small small region and that actually is the point around which everything rotates at least in the very center of our galaxy where all the stars rotate around and so this is where all the four million solar masses are concentrated and in fact, that has some similarities with the radio sources in other galaxies, in quasars and others, in terms of properties. And it was in, in fact uh, predicted by Sir Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, um, who, who actually said in the 70s, well, if these quasars you know, have supermassive black holes, at that time we didn't know it was just a theory, um, that we, our Milky Way should have something in the very center, a little radio source perhaps. And indeed it was discovered uh, in 1974. Uh, that radio source was discovered and ever since has been the target of our investigations uh, for uh, the last 40, uh, 40 years. And you know, during my PhD I realized that actually a certain type of radio emission comes from very close, you know, if that's a black hole, would come from very close to the event horizon. And so I was wondering how does a black hole actually look like and could we actually see it? And uh, you know, how a black hole looks like you can find in the literature. And uh, one of the first uh, papers was here by, by Cunningham and Bardeen, and they just calculated you know, how a star would look like if it orbits around a, a black hole. And what you see is the star, even though it's on an elliptical orbit, would show up at different locations on the sky. And that's simply because of light bending. The light would be bent uh, and would make the star appear on different locations. And uh, you know, this already traces out the basic shape of most of popular uh, uh, um, depictions of how black holes look like. They are not necessarily the ones that we actually are looking at in the center of our Milky Way. This was a, pa uh, a paper later by Illuminé uh, in, in end of the 70s calculating actually in a computer by drawing by hand how uh, you know, a, a disk of gas around a black hole would look like. And you see it here so absorbing the black hole. There's something here, uh, a big hole. And then, you know, overall the same structure that we see, uh, that we saw in the previous paper, and that is due to the light bending. And then, of course, Hollywood, if you go to the, the film Interstellar, you see this, you know, uh, with the help of Kip Thorne, um, pretty much the same picture now with a bit more color and some, actually, some physics uh, effects missing for the Hollywood movie. Uh, and then NASA uh, 2019 pretty much looks the same. The only thing that changed was the color. And I can't, you know, help but think that the, the reason why they changed the color actually was due to our uh, paper which came out just at the same year and I'll say a word about this more in the future and in the next slides. So um, this is how black hole uh, light rays, uh, how light rays look like if, they, if you shine them at a black hole. And what you see here is your light comes in, uh, this black hole is rotating and space is co-rotating, so the light actually goes back here and then ends up in the event horizon. So there are all kinds of light rays that go for, come from the distance and then they end up in, in the black hole itself. Um, and, uh, and this is actually an effect that was already calculated or, again in 1916, how light rays behave near a black hole. Um, the famous, famous mathematician David Hilbert 
uh, was calculate, calculating that, and this is a, uh, a figure from Max von der Laue a few years later. And what's quite interesting is there's a certain distance when you shoot a light ray parallel at a black hole, it will actually be deflected and it will end up at a circular orbit. It will actually, you know, circle the black hole forever. Okay. Of course, that's a mathematical, uh, mathematical statement. In reality, light will, you know, if it, it's a bit closer, it will actually go around the black hole and end up in the black hole, or it will actually be able to, you know, it will be bent, but be able to escape. But this is sort of a watershed separation here for light rays that either go inside or go outside. And that, you know, makes a very sharp boundary if you shine light at it. And, uh, uh, and this is something that, that, you know, in the, in the 90s, I was working on the galactic center black hole. We were doing studies of the radio emission. And as I said, you know, we realized as you go to higher and higher radio frequencies, we would be approaching the black hole. And the, the models predicted that um, that black hole in the center of our Milky Way would be surrounded by actually a more extended configuration of, of radio emitting gas uh, that would be actually transparent, that it could actually partially look through. And so that black hole would be illuminated by light rays coming from all directions. How would th that look like? And so that was a slightly different picture because the, the, our understanding of astrophysics has changed since the 70s when people initially thought, you know, black holes are all surrounded by this thin disk which are optically thick. We now think they are surrounded by, uh, at least when you have, you know, a low power black hole as in the center of our Milky Way, but more extended configurations, which is more transparent um, and, uh, and producing strong radio emission. And so we were calculating that for very different configurations in around 2000. And what was so uh, ex ex amazing to see was whatever we did to the astrophysics, you know, however, we, we rearranged the gas, you know, sometimes it was rotating, sometimes it was just radially infalling. In this case, we put it into a cylindrical structure, which, you know, s supposed to symbolize a jet, a plasma that shoots out. Um, and what you would see here is you would always see this dark region. And that's, you know, from this effect that light disappears in the event horizon. And um, uh, we call this in this paper, the shadow of a black hole, because you don't really see the black hole itself. You cannot see a black hole. Black hole is a singularity uh, in the very center and curved space time that actually extends all the way to infinity. But what you can see is its shadow where the light disappears. And that has a very well defined shape. And you could predict how large this is. It's actually you know, 10 times the so-called gravitational radius, which is a characteristic scale of the black hole. Um, and that's proportional to the black hole mass. So, so the bigger a black hole, the bigger its shadow in a linear fashion. And that's, you know, easy to predict. And so we also said that, you know, in order to, to see this, we would actually be able to use a very long baseline interferometry, uh, which is a technique to actually build large scale radio telescopes to uh, actually see, uh, event see the event horizon. Now I see I've been talking a lot, so I've, I, I, yeah, I will speed up a little bit um, explaining what actually the shadow really is. But really, if you want to think about it in a, in a classical way, uh, it's like a teapot that you put into a campfire. Okay, you have a black hole in the middle of a glowing uh, cloud, and then uh, the, the black hole will just absorb the light. In fact, it will perfectly absorb the light, much better than any teapot, because the teapot will heat up at some point and start to radiate itself. And the only difference for GR is that, you know, if you do it classically, uh, the shadow will be that size. And if you have GR, general relativity of Albert Einstein, then the shadow will be actually two and a half times larger. That's the main difference. Now, these days we uh, calculate black holes and their appearance in a much more uh, complicated way. We actually put much more physics into it than, you know, in this first paper in the 2000s. Uh, we have, you know, fluid dynamic simulations, which include magnetic fields. And we see, you know, what happens to gas and where is all the gas if we do this. So what you see here is a torus of gas surrounding a black hole. That's a computer si simulation. Uh, and that is threaded by these uh, uh, magnetic field lines. And now we let the, the gas accrete or, or, or rate, uh, rotate, and you see that the inner parts rotate faster because, you know, the closer you are, the stronger gravity is, the faster you have to rotate. And what happens in the end, all the magnetic fields in this, uh, in this structure will be wrapped up and look, look like a spaghetti bowl, a bowl of spaghetti. 
Um, and when you get very close to the event horizon, uh, actually there's a buildup of, um, of magnetic field lines. And what you will see is that some parts of these magnetic field lines will shoot out again along the rotation axis. Uh, and that now naturally happens in all our simulations. And that explains why we see these plasma jets shooting out. So there is some, there are some fraction of the mass that falls in is actually lucky to escape. So that's always my advice. If you fall into, if you're falling into a black hole, try to hold on to some magnetic field lines. Maybe you're lucky and you're able to escape again with some of these magnetic field lines. Now, if you've done these uh, simulations of how the plasma behaves, how magnetic fields are, are wrapped up, um, you can put in radiation. Uh, how radiation is created, how radiation is absorbed, and how light is being bent around. And that's what we've been doing here uh, in a special color coding. Uh, coming back to the color coding, uh, and we are simulating radio waves, which is sort of a very red, 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 red uh, uh, light. Um, and uh, so in this first theory prediction paper, we made these, these shadow predictions red. Okay, it was also supposed to simulate glowing heat, ga uh, hot gas. Uh, and so uh, that color scale stuck. But of course, it's not a real color. It's something that we gave to the simulations. Okay, it's nothing we can see with our naked eyes. And so here we give it, uh, we actually simulate all colors, actually all radio waves, and you know, we make it appear red. And we see actually this smoke coming out, which is uh, these, these plasma jets shooting out. And you, you know, see it rotating here around the very center, and uh, it, it becomes very hot, looks like a volcano. In the very center, you see the darkness of the black hole, you see, see the shadow. And if you then uh, go to the highest frequencies, and I, I said, you know, the higher the frequency, the closer you get to the black hole, you come, you know, to the prediction of this, uh, uh, this structure that you expect to see, which is light being bent around the black hole and the shadow in the very center. And uh, if you do this for M87, the size of this would be 40 micro arc seconds. This is about the size of a mustard seed, you know, millimeter sized object in New York as seen from, from Europe. Now, how do you see something like this? You have to build a telescope the size of the world. And uh, we call this the Event Horizon Telescope because this is, you know, the largest ground-based telescope you can build at the highest radio frequencies. And so that gives you the highest uh, resolution that we have available in astronomy these days. And uh, the way we do this is, uh, I'll, I'll skip the history a little bit, uh, the way we do this is that we actually connect telescopes that are distributed over the entire Earth. And, you know, we store radio emission at the uh, different location as light comes in. We store the radio waves on hard drives. We have an atomic clock at each of these telescopes and we so later synchronize all these data. And then we do what a big telescope would have done. You know, telescope would have uh, collected the light waves, actually would have reflected in a, in a big dish or a, a mirror, uh, would have reflected the light and focused it in the focus point. And that focusing, that exact focusing of the light, we do in the computer afterwards. Now, because we stored the light, we can store it because it's cl almost classical waves, uh, and we can process in the computer, and then we do what a camera would do or what a telescope would do. Okay, so in that sense, it's, it's true imaging, but with light that is sort of beyond what we can see with our naked eyes, with radio light. And we did this first experiment, so let me go back. The first experiment, in, well, we did prototype experiment, but the first successful or big experiment was in April 2017, and it was an amazing success. Not only all the te technology worked, but there was also perfect weather around the world because you had these high frequencies, these sm small wavelengths, every cloud, every water vapor content in the, uni in, in the atmosphere will actually absorb these radio waves. Uh, it's not like low frequency radio waves that just go through uh, rain clouds. Uh, these you know, little waves actually get stuck in clouds and we just had wonderful weather. Um, and I'll just show you a little movie. Uh, of one of the telescopes where I was in actually Spain, uh, at, uh, in Pico Veleta near Granada, uh, a 30 meter dish by the Institute IRAM. And we are going, uh, oh, I didn't want the movie, uh, the music here. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the cheesy music. <laughs> so we're going up here with actually a ski lift uh, all the way up to uh, uh, the telescope. You see it's sort of April, the snow is already melted. And, um, yeah, now we, we take a, a uh, I forgot how you call this in English, 
uh, call this piston bully in, in German, um, up to, to the mountain with a crew uh, from, uh, from observers, from uh, support staff, and, uh, yeah, and, and other astronomers, because we were you know, not using a telescope all the time. And so uh, we could have been skiing you know, during the time, but you know, we're so busy that I you know, unfortunately couldn't you know, enjoy the snow. This is a 30 meter dish here in, uh, in Spain that you see. And uh, it's, it's from the 70s, but still you know, works wonderfully. And this is equipment that we're using here with all the racks of hard drives. You know, each of these little boxes had uh, uh, eight hard drives. This is a control room. Looks a little bit like a Bond movie from the 70s because you know, that's the age it was built. And uh, nice weather, some clouds, but actually during night they went away uh, and we were able to observe. So um, I'll, I'll skip that part. We had other telescopes as well, South Pole, Chile, Mexico, Hawaii, Arizona, uh, that was a Spain one. And it was very tiring. This was a crew here from Chile before, that was a crew from Chile afterwards. It was like, you know, you know, one and a half weeks, really, you know, day and night uh, work and preparation. And, um, and then you put everything together. And that sh animation shows how this works. So uh, if you have uh, a world telescope and you have this virtual telescope, then light will come in, you know, it would be reflected and then focused in the, in, in the focus area. That said, we are actually saving uh, the data here at these at these two points and then later do that aspect and if you have uh and that's like you know you bring this light in actually it works like a big interferometer that's why we call it very long baseline interferometry because it's so so far away uh now if you have you know one line connected uh, then you see this, this wave this interferometry pattern but the more lines the more connections you have the more perspectives you have the more clearly appears the structure of uh, the object well, in this case, it's a teapot again. It's Russell's teapot, so, so to speak, that we've we've discovered in the simulation. But uh, you know, if if, it, if that object would have been a teapot, we, we'd be able to to, to tell that. Um, and uh, you don't have a perfect image because we don't have uh, telescopes all over the world. But at least the basic structure you can see. And so uh, the amazing moment then was when we you know, made our first images. And it was really, you know, the first time I saw that image uh, that we made, it was in, the, in, in 2018, a year before the big press conference. Uh, it was just really an awe-inspiring moment, I must say, um, because it was, you know, better than my wildest dreams uh, had, had been. Because I had expected that we, you know, the first experiment will fail and we see something crappy and so forth. But it was a beautiful, wonderful image. Uh, and we, we checked it, we, like we had different teams looking at the data, we split up individual teams where we're doing blind tests and so forth, calculating, uh, comparing with simulations, and, uh, uh, it, uh, and then in, in April 10, 2019, we we're able to present it to the world in different press conferences around the world. Uh, one of the biggest ones was in Brussels, in, uh, uh, in the brick hall, uh, press hall there, and uh, presenting that image. In fact, we were scared because this was a time of uh, Brexit discussions and, and Th Theresa May was coming the same day and holding a big press conference. We were a bit worried that uh, the press would mainly talk about Brexit, but you know, this day people talked about black holes. And uh, I'll take you to this moment when we were revealing that, that image and I was standing on, on the stage there and was allowed to, you know, to, to show that. And we were showing that movie um, with, uh, in fact, you know, music was made by my son who was making film music. And we are uh, zooming into, by a factor of 10 to the 9, so 1 billion, into uh, the universe towards the constellation Virgo. And we're seeing here the uh, galaxy M87 show up, this big bubble that now comes out, uh, that comes. And then you see the galaxy here, you see this uh, plasma jet shooting out. We're following the previous astronomical data, zooming deeper and deeper closer to the nucleus and we see always this jet coming out until we see the origin where it all comes from it looks like that and you see you know uh, this ring of light and the darkness in the very center it looks completely different than everything we'd seen before from this galaxy in with, with using this technique because now we are very close to the black hole you see some little hair structure here this is not real structure 
this shows you the uh, the direction of where the light how the light is oscillating this is what we call polarization uh, that's something that we added later in a second uh, measurement or action and so and that whole structure that we see is actually of the size of our solar system and uh, if we know there are six billion masses concentrated in this region and you see sort of this light ring where light is going in a circle you know it's the size of our solar system more or less uh, and that was big news so at, you know as i said that day it wasn't brexit it was actually black holes that uh, dominated the press well not always you know brexit looks like from space or you know there was some other you know, internet was going uh, nuts with all kinds of uh, interesting you know uh, usage of, of that image uh, but it was an, an amazing moment for the first time to actually look into so to speak the gates of hell uh, with your well you could say with your bare eyes you know helped and guided by by radio telescopes you also did simulations this year is a a numerical simulation of gas going around the black hole you see this thin ring of light that we see and we varied the model and we had very different uh, simulations and actually a 60,000 images that we calculated of black holes and uh, they all showed that ring more or less and then if you compare you know a model and then you know you you, you look at the observations and you blur the model to the resolution uh, of your, your telescope then it actually you know it's amazing how well this actually fits the observations and uh, what's also amazing you see the stripes here that's the polarization um, that's the the way that that light actually is um, is oscillating in, in which direction that tells you something about the magnetic fields uh, that tells you about the magnetic fields that are launching this plasma jet very near the event horizon and in fact if you look at that data it you know very nicely fits with these models that i just showed where you see actually that near the black hole the uh, you know the, the the magnetic fields actually are swung are, are shot out and uh, and become very strong uh, and that's what the polarization tells us and that's the first time we actually see really how jets are being launched in the vicinity of black holes and that's another very important uh, finding what we also see is that when these plasma jets shoot out um, that we actually the radiation is not filling the entire cone but actually is in our simulations is happening at the outskirts it's like an hourglass shape that we see and in fact that's also what we now see in in in, in this vlbi very long baseline observation you see here an image of a of m87 uh, the same galaxy i just showed at longer wavelengths you see that sort of its edge brightened pretty much how we see our simulations and very recently um oh i oh, oh, oh i was looking for another one uh, i overlooked Ah, there's one image I wanted to show, which isn't here, um, because we had a nice new picture of uh, Galaxy Centaurus A, which I don't have in my, somehow I deleted, okay, forgot to put in. I think I had two different <laughs> versions yesterday. Uh, and so we see that we used the, the, the telescope to actually look at another nearby galaxy, Centaurus A, we see exactly the same. So it, it looks like we are really you know, getting a better handle on understanding how jets are being launched and uh, uh, what's what's happening near black holes. What we also did, we went back to old data uh, of M87 because what's very important is this ring, you know, yeah, maybe we are being fooled. Maybe that ring is just, you know, something uh, like a smoke tr uh, smoke ring that's coming out of these plasma jets. You know, some, some of my colleagues say that, yeah, why isn't that maybe just some accident, some freak accident that you're looking at? And that's true, it could have been, but we had previous data from previous observations um, where we didn't have enough telescopes to make an image but we could constrain the size of the source and if you know it's a, it's a ring you can go back to the data and look how big would that ring be be and over the last 10 years the size of that ring didn't really change much uh, it actually is consistent with the same size over 10 years and you know any smoke ring you know in, in plasma ring would have been would have flown out uh, out of this source. So we're fairly confident that what we see really is a, a signature of strong gravity. Um, and, um, and so uh, what's in the future? We've done more observations. We had another campaign in 2018. We lost one telescope due to some, some problems in 2018. Uh, we are still at the edge of how many telescopes we, we, uh, uh, we need. Uh, so we actually we need, would need more telescopes in the future. 
um, in 2021, uh, we, had, we managed to have another campaign. Again, one telescope was missing in Mexico, but we had some new ones. We had uh, in, in France, Noema, in the Greenland telescope, and there was one in, in Arizona, Kitt Peak. Uh, so it's three more telescopes. So we hope to get better images of M87 uh, in, in the next two years or so. And we still, of course, have the data of the center for Milky Way from 2017, which we haven't released, but which we are working on, which will come out uh, eventually. Now, uh, getting more telescopes. This is now uh, the plans for the upgrade. We are working on a project called the African Millimeter Telescope, where uh, we want to put a telescope into, uh, uh, into Namibia, and that nicely connects with uh, Chile, with, uh, with the European telescopes, and with South Pole, and you know, can give us you know, more stable images, particularly for the center of our Milky Way, one of places on the second highest mountain in, uh, in Namibia, in, 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 West, in, in, in Southwest Africa, in the Southwest of Africa. Uh, and we couple this to actually a, an outreach program uh, because we do this together with University of uh, Wintok and the Racing Foundation in, uh, in Namibia. And so we have a mobile planetarium, something that we have in the Netherlands as well. We go to all the schools in the Netherlands and we try to do the same. In fact, after Corona, we started before Corona, we had to stop. Uh, and we hope to, to restart that program to go to all the schools, uh, particularly the rural schools, in, in Namibia together with the Russing Foundation, which has a, a, a mobile app already and you know, supports schools there. Now in the long future, we wanna to go to space. You know, a telescope, uh, the Earth is not enough. You know, we need bigger telescopes, longer baselines. And we can do this by, for example, here, putting three dishes, just three dishes. I mean, it's uh, you know, just three, <laughs> but actually you could put those into one Ariana launch, in fact. Um, and uh, have them orbit at slightly different orbital heights. They would go around and they will sort of drift apart. They would rotate around the Earth. You would get all orientations and all separations. You get all perspectives on, on the black hole at higher frequencies, at higher, um, at higher resolution at, 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 with longer baselines. And so you get much better images. And you can, you know, this kind of configuration, you could just adapt to your needs and just, a question of money <laughs> and, and, and how much you can afford and how much you want to do, you know, which black holes you want to see and how well. Uh, this here is an example of uh, the center of Milky Way. This is a simulation of the black hole in the very center. This is how you would it look like if you would average it. And that's what you could get the sharpness, you know, that you could get uh, from space. Or this here is a, uh, a model of M87. You could make a movie. You know, you see this ring here, you see the jet shooting out. Um, and uh, th this is a movie, how stuff uh, behaves in the vicinity of black hole. And you can recover that movie almost perfectly with a space interferometer. So um, it's just a question of time and will when we really, really, you know, look at all the details of black holes and understand uh, how they're launching jets, what's happening near the event horizon. And you know, of course, testing gravity and, and, and relativity in, in great detail. So let me conclude. Um, I mean, we are fairly confident. We have seen the shadow of a black hole. We are looking to the darkness of the event horizon. We are literally, I mean, this is amazing. You have to think, we're just looking at this. But you know, if you think about it, we are looking at the end of space and time, really at the, at the, at the border of, of, of scientific investigation. Because uh, you know, in terms of measurement, even even if you know Hawking is right and there's uh, an almost infinite amount of time, some information will come out of black holes. This is the end. We cannot measure anything inside of the black hole. Any information that will come out will be so totally scrambled. That's you know that this is a region which is absolutely fascinating, with fascinating physics inside, but we cannot see it. Um, and uh, you know the. Uh, uh, um, and of course, you know, it was a, a, an experiment that was done uh, with the entire world. Um, we, we used the entire world and we had the entire world participating. We had almost all continents uh, represented. Uh, the Americas, Africa, Europe, uh, Asia participating in this. And we did it all digitally before even Corona and we got it to work. Um, and uh, in the future, 
we're going to do more. Um, we have more experiments. We're going to use space. And we will be um, we're doing more simulations. And, and maybe the most important thing that will come out of this is that there will be some little girl in Africa will be inspired to become the new Einstein and come up with a completely new theory how space and time can be described. And maybe, you know, in contradiction to what I just said, maybe there is a way to overcome that final boundary of the event horizon. But maybe not. Maybe we're just fighting our last battle and, you know, we're rattling at the gates of hell and the, at the sort of the, the door to heaven, so to speak, with a big bang, and maybe we'll never, you know, cross them. And that's, that's the end of uh, all our knowledge. It's at least a very exciting moment in the history of science, I think, to be you know, seeing that with your own eyes and think about what could lie ahead in the very future. Um, at the end, you know, a little bit of, uh, if you want to know more about this entire story, uh, I wrote this up in, in this book and, um, uh, and you're, you know, maybe that's something that you'd be interested in. Thank you very much for listening and looking forward to your questions. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Heino. Absolutely fantastic talk. Um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of questions. I mean, yeah, it's rare we get a talk about where we end by talking about knocking at the gates of heaven or uh, or uh, whether the, and, and that brilliant line about the world not being enough. I'm paraphrasing slightly, but uh, yeah, uh, astronomers as Bond villains, I think. But um, anyway, so uh, there's a load of questions. I'm going to try and take a few. We've got about 10 minutes. So Let's start. Joy Deep uh, Bachish, uh, they ask, do we live inside a black hole universe? Is that why we cannot communicate with other universes? Well, no. I mean, in, in a sense, um, the, the, the space time of, of our universe is described by a completely different solution. You know, an expanding space time that's very different from a, a black hole, which is sort of a collapsing uh, static space time, in fact. Um, but the reason why we cannot communicate is, is more because of the sheer size. Uh, so light rays can go out, but actually the universe is expanding faster. And it turns out if, if everything continues like now, then most of the stars and galaxies we see, we would never be able to reach even without in our own universe uh, because they move away faster than speed of light because the universe, the, the fabric of space time expands much faster. So that's a more limiting factor. But yes, we are limited to this one universe. And there are some ideas that people say, you know, we could see traces of the previous universes, but I honestly have my doubts that we do. And we certainly don't, we don't have clear evidence and we may never. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, next one then, Keith Mansfield asks, uh, and this sort of relates to some others, but I'll bring in those too. So he asks, are there kind of potential future targets for a new event horizon telescope? So could we use the same approach to say, observe something like exoplanets? Um, well, you need strong for y yes and no. We need strong radio emission uh, to see this. And that's what produced near black holes. Exoplanets usually don't have strong enough radio emission. We would need really, really big radio telescopes and then combine them to actually be able to see uh, exoplanets in great detail. But the same technology you can do with optical telescopes. So you can place them on the moon or as, a, as an interferometer in space. And therefore you have you know, optical telescopes combined uh, over kilometers, tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, that's in principle possible and could give us some, you know, could give us a view of, of, of exoplanets at some point. It would be a massively expensive experiment, though, but it's not, it's, it's definitely not excluded. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm taking one from YouTube. Um, Eskander says there were some articles saying there could be dark matter instead of a massive black hole in the center of our galaxy. What are your thoughts on that? It, it's not an either or, it's, it's certainly both. Uh, we, we think there, are, uh, there is, is going to be a dark matter cusp in the, in the very center of our galaxy. Um, the question is how much? It could also be that dark matter falls into a black hole, pro probably not at a high rate. It wouldn't matter. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, whatever falls into a black hole makes the black hole just bigger. If it's, it's a dark matter or, or any matter or, or doesn't matter, <laughs> it, it, it always makes it bigger. Okay. So in that sense, um, but we're also looking for alternatives. There are some ideas that could be fuzz, fuzz balls of strings, which are not black holes, but they require rather special circumstances uh, for each black hole would have to have its own elementary particle and so forth. So they are, I mean, really, really 
uh, not appealing models at this very moment, but we, we calculate how they would look like and how, you know, whether we could distinguish them. It's certainly an interesting, I mean, the interesting thing, we can now start asking these questions. You know, we can ask not only just, is it a black hole, but what kind of black hole is it? And um, uh, yeah, okay. and, and that, that is just starting. Okay, uh, Sama asks, and uh, also Paul Johnson, a related question, where would the black hole take me if I dive into it? And Paul Johnson is then asking, which I think relates to this nicely, is there any evidence for white holes anywhere in the universe where matter is entering the universe from the singular? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, a normal, a non-rotating black hole, you just go straight to the very center and be, you know, just crushed. You could survive inside a black hole. Uh, if it's, a, you know, if you fall into M87, this very big one, uh, it's so big, you can fall into it, you're not gonna be spaghetti fight. Um, you could go inside, you could actually go around, if it's rotating, you'd have a singularity which is in a ring. You could even travel around the singularity and survive for, for much longer. Um, theoretically, you could even go to a different universe, but I think that's not a real universe, it's more a mathematical universe. So in that sense, this is a, you know, a, a theoretical physics uh, thing and not a, real, um, not a real universe. And the white hole, which is sort of the opposite of a black hole and could be, you know, that's what wormholes are made of, you know, black hole and the white hole, uh, so to speak, where only things come out. We don't have any evidence how this could form uh, that, that exists anywhere in the universe. And um, in fact, wormholes uh, would also be require, you know, to be traversable, require some kind of a matter that doesn't exist. So there are, you know, you know you know, I was joking about you know, people thinking black holes are unicorns. They weren't. Uh, weren't you know, they're sort of dark unicorns or, or pink unicorns. I think white holes and wormholes probably are. Um, but you know, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um, but you know, for now, I, I think there, there, for now, there's really no shred of evidence that, that those things exist. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions around gravitational waves. Um, so. One is how the discovery of gravitational waves has created new ways to detect black holes. And then also a kind of related one from Amra Ditya Pradhan, who says a question from a fresher. Um, and they're asking about how gravitational waves traverse large distances without being corrupted by intervening masses. Oh, yeah, that two good questions. Um, the first one is, yes, I mean, gravitational wave, I, mean, I, I skipped a little slide or, or, um, because of lack of time. Um, they actually measure, for now, stellar mass black holes. In fact, they're produced at exactly the same location uh, where our ring of light is being produced. So they're probing pretty much the same aspects of gravity, and they're coming up with the same answer. And so gravity, the theory of relativity, can describe stellar mass black holes, you know, uh, gravitation waves, and supermassive black holes, you changing by a factor 100 million in mass. That's just an amazing success of the theory that, you know, over 100, of a factor of 10 to the 8, 100 million, uh, you come up with the same answer. So uh, in that sense, um, this, this is a very important complementary uh, way of studying black holes. And we'll be seeing more and more black holes, we're actually seeing them or hearing them, so to speak, all the time with gravitational wave detectors. And in the future, we'll be able to see even uh, supermassive black holes merge with uh, big space uh, emissions. So I think that we just, you know, we're just starting an, an era of, of space-time research. You know, in the last century was the era of, of, of particle physics. I think now we're in the era of space-time physics uh, that is just beginning. So we'll, we'll be looking forward to some amazing results in the future. And are gravitational waves dis uh, disrupted? Yes, they are. Um, they'll be affected by the rest of gravity as well, uh, by, you know, what's in the universe. But the universe is pr pretty much empty. So in, in that sense, uh, it's, our, it's, it's a very minor fact that we cannot detect at this moment. Fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna give you one more question because frankly, we're running out of time and there are, I mean, 33 more questions which we can't possibly put to you, but, but they're all- Are, are they on YouTube or? Uh... Uh, they're on the, they're on the uh, Q and A. If people, if people don't get an answer today and they want to put them on YouTube, then we can point those to you as well. If you have time to comment on them, that would be Yeah, I could, I could later today, I could, could try to answer some there. That would be yeah. great. I mean, you heard it here. That's a brilliant offer. Thank you, Hannah, for that. Okay, so the last question I'm gonna ask them, which is from what YouTube actually are, and they asked, uh, is there a maximum size to the mass of a black hole? Not that we know of at, at this point. Um, at some point I was just calculating that of course a, uni a black hole will be so large um, that it would actually start accreting from the, 
from the uh, cosmic microwave background, it would actually grow infinitely, uh, exponentially, and just follow the entire universe. But that is a much higher mass uh, that hasn't been reached. Uh, that would be actually dangerous. Um, but in principle, we don't know of any any maximum mass. No, and that's uh, black holes only know one direction for now. It just they just keep growing, and in in in, in ten of the in another you know, hundreds of billions of years, we'll see much, much bigger black holes for sure. Well, if we are around, uh, we are not, but someone <laughs> may. That, that's a deep question as well, which to answer this. So look, thank you so much. Absolutely, an absolute pleasure having you here today, albeit virtually. We'd obviously love to see you in London sometime as well, but thank you for this absolutely profound talk. Um, I do, I haven't read your book yet, but I'm now very motivated. I need to order this. And I recommend it in the book club we do in our podcast as well. And I'm sure everybody else will, will get hold of a copy too. Um, it's published in different languages as well. I can see from the uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it was a yeah. It's it's now it was actually a big best bestseller in Germany, but you know not so much known in the UK. So you know if, if you well, we'll, we'll try it. and change that way right, with <laughs> the, uh, well, webcasts like this. So. Look, thank you uh, so much again. We can't give you applause because everybody's on a webinar, um, but I will end uh, you know, by giving my personal thanks to you giving up your time for Dane from Lucinda, who's uh, in the background as well. And we'll bring this to a close in a second. I just want to end by saying that this is an ongoing program of talks. Next month, we have uh, Professor Lewis Dartnell from the University of Westminster, who is an astrobiologist, but also a, a popular science writer. And his talk would be Origins, How the Earth Itself Shaped Human History. So I do hope as... Uh, Many of you, as possible, can join us next time for what uh, also promises to be a fantastic offer. But other that than that, um, thank you, Heine. It's always very abrupt. We have to shut this down for everybody, including participants and yourself. But thank you once again, and uh, delighted to have you. Bye bye. <laughs>